Welcome back to Ever Ancient, Ever New, the podcast in which we search for the hidden gems and the forgotten treasures of the church. I'm joined by a special guest today, Jim Schrader. Jim Schrader, yes. And uh, from Evansville, Illinois, or Indiana? Indiana. Indiana, yes, right okay. southwestern corner of Indiana right there. Yeah, yeah, there. good. So he's in he's in town to do a, a talk at the parish, and I said, hey, this is a great opportunity to um, just get a little little wisdom here on the podcast. It might be something a little different for from the talk tonight and um, for people who aren't able to, yeah. to be there. So appreciate the invite. Thank yeah. You very much. Yeah. No, this is great. Great to have you. So we've been, I mean, we've already been talking for an hour. We probably should have recorded all of that conversation. As well. Our car conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, um, you know, uh, let me, let me start off with this because probably you I mean, you're a pediatric psychologist, mm -hmm. right? Right. And, and that's, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a big, that's a big title. And probably people think that you're a little bit crazy. I mean, psychologists kind of get that right sometimes, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, they think you're analyzing you. That's the question yeah, I was getting. Right. Is, are, are you analyzing, are you analyzing me right right? Yes. Um, but and I'm like, I got too many other things going on. Right. So. Not only that, but I mean, you're Catholic, which is kind of crazy right. in this day and age. Right. And, and as a psychologist, I mean, that's like, that's crazy. Right. And then you have eight kids. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's right. That's, that's crazy. That, yes. And then you do ultra marathons and triathlons. That's crazy. I mean, we're piling it on. Here. Is there anything? Yes. Is there any other anything else we can throw on to get our listeners uh, to stop listening? Yeah, because this right, guy is exactly. absolutely. Uh, nice. I bike to work most days. Okay. Half of the last fifteen years, so that's probably on top of that yeah. list. And oh uh, yeah, you're anti. your anti cell phone. Well, so it was interesting. <laughs> I I want to be clear to your listeners here. I'm not anti cell phone, but I will say this: I have not had a cell phone um, really in my life. I, wow. I I did bring one with me today when I travel. We kind of have a house cell phone. Yeah. But I have made the intentional decision um, all the way back. If you go all the way back to college, my wife and I would talk on a Lynn cell phone. But from that point forward, when we got married and everything else. And I thank you, Amy, for being so supportive. But I've never had a cell phone to that point. Wow. Forward, so, yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, I like to, I like to tell kids today when you know uh, they're like, well, my parents won't let me have a cell phone and blah blah blah. <laughs> and there's this one family that I know, and they got they got ten kids, and they're you know like they're serious about their parenting, and they're like, no, we're not doing we're not doing cell phones. Right. Like once you start driving, we'll talk about you know what type of phone you're getting, right. but it's not right. going to be a smartphone. And this kid's in middle school, and he's like, he comes up to us like. Did you know that only 13% of middle schoolers don't have a cell phone? That puts me in the minority. <laughs> but you could tell that he was like, he was a little bit proud of that. Yeah. Also, you know? Well, and, and to add to it, not only have, do I not have a cell phone, but um, we made the intentional choice and we can talk about this more, but our oldest who are twins, they're seniors this year, um, just got their first cell phone for Christmas. Mm. So uh, we are the family. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of things to kind of come with this, but we made that intentional decision that they didn't have one through high school or much of high yeah. school. And, um, you know, it carries with the challenges, but it's actually been really nice. There's been a lot of great things that have come out of it. And as a psychologist, I mean, there's a lot of science behind the decisions there. But Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I like to tell those kids, I say, well, I didn't have a cell phone until after I was out of college. I mean, 100% of our graduating <laughs> class didn't have a cell phone until, yeah. Well, they didn't well, have them school. back then. I'm like, that is not the point. I survived. Right. That's the <laughs> I, right. You know, my only my only complaint against not giving kids cell phones when they're young is that I have a close family that, you know, I, you know, I watch them grow up and, you know, close friends with them. And now they're all adults. And so they'll, you know, you know, they're, I'm in their life in a different way. And it's just really neat. And um, they are terrible at texting. Oh, no. They just don't <laughs> respond to text because they didn't have those years and years, those formative years. Right. Middle school is formative years. If you're not texting in middle school you're probably going to be a bad texter the rest of your life. That's my theory. It probably would be a bad texter. I, I probably <laughs> would fall in that category. That's right. If you don't feel the pressure to have to text immediately when you're younger, <laughs> yeah. right? You're probably not going to feel the pressure when you're yeah, younger. Yeah. So that's the side of You, you yes. haven't been yes. conditioned by the, you know, the dopamine hit that's of right. the, the buzz in your pocket and like, oh, I got to respond to that right away so I can get another, yeah. another hit. The FOMO oh. has not taken over. Right? Yeah. You're missing yeah. out on the text. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah, good. No, there was there was a priest I knew, and uh, he was the vice rector of the seminary, and he was going to go. I'm like, I'm going to. He's going to go. No cell phone, and he did it for about two weeks mm -hmm. until the rector was like, I can never get a hold of you. You need to have. Cell phone. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned this though. I I give a presentation every year to eighth graders about just general health, and we talk about a lot of different areas. And I do open up the idea that I haven't had a cell phone, and. You should see the look on their faces when I say that. I mean, I've had questions over the year like, you know, almost like a look of shock. 
And I'll, I'll get these like kids firing up their hands. And, and some of the questions will go something like this, like, how do you get your kids to soccer practice? <laughs> to which I say, I drive them to soccer practice. How do people get a hold of you? I'm like, well, I have a phone next to me on my desk. We have a, you know, general office phone. We've got phones at home, but you know, they can't conceive of a world <laughs> yeah. without it. And it, it has drawn some really funny questions over the years from these eighth graders who just like, it blows their mind, right? right? It seems impossible to live, even though of course, you know, 20 years ago, we all lived without it, but it seems impossible. Yeah, so. yeah no, it, it's good. What what are what are some of the, you know, like we, many of us have seen the, the social dilemma, mm -hmm. um, you right. know, if you haven't, I think it's really well it's worth well seeing. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, I remember seeing, uh, I remember reading something in the, I think it's the Wall Street or New York Post or something a number of years back, um, maybe eight years, you know, so, but I remember, I mean, some of the studies that just jumped out to me were one, one, one of them was this, they did a test to see, um, who did better on a, on a, on a test exam. Yeah. And if the phone was on your desk, which is where most kids phones tend to be, if they're allowed to have them in the classroom and that's right. it, um, they did worse than if they were in their pocket, who did worse than if they were out in the in their locker, yep. which is fascinating. They weren't looking at them. They they out where they were all asked, "Was your phone a distraction to you?" No, it wasn't right. a distraction. Right. And and they did worse the closer it was to their their sphere of reference and their. Um, and that was initially done at Rutgers and has since been replicated. Okay, yeah. Like study and you're right. Proximity, you know, as we get into so many different areas about this, it's interesting that proximity really does relate to how well like achievement's going to occur with relation to that phone. And so there's something about, I, I think this is one thing we all, we have to consider as parents is that we probably don't put enough weight into the unconscious world. Like mm. we, we often say, well, if yeah. I tell my kids to do this, or I teach my kids to not do this, then I, I think that that's going to work. And I'm not, of course, you know, as parents and, and as a father of eight, you know, we have to really teach our kids continuously. But what I would say from a psychology standpoint, from a research standpoint, is we're probably a little bit, I hate to use the word prideful, but prideful that our conscious actions can overwhelm the unconscious reality. Mm. And to your point about proximity, what the study kind of, you know, unveiled for everyone and has since unveiled in other studies is that just the unconscious reality of my phone being there is taking my attention and everything, you know, I always say as a psychologist, everything begins and ends with attention, right? So if your focus, wherever it is, it's going to, you know, it's going to basically impact things like memory and learning and all of that, right? So if my attention is this phone right here, and it's close enough that I'm, I'm thinking about what's coming into it, well, the seed of the unconscious is that I am dividing my attention, right? And right, so ultimately right. that yeah. what they found in that Rutgers study and others have found is that, like you said, over the course of a semester, the achievement went down and it's by the factor of just location in essence. That, wow. So it's a pretty powerful, yeah. pretty powerful example. You know, another powerful example to think about attention is that they, um, JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, published a study years ago. And what they did was they followed a group, a um, large group of freshmen in high school. And so they followed them out for a couple of years. And they what they looked at lots of different variables, lots of things that could impact like, and they were looking at attention specifically, right? But one of the variables they looked at was just, just the, the degree of usage of, you know, digital usage online, you know, access and things like that. And the freshmen they looked at had no identified ADHD or any concerns. Two years later, the group that had the high to moderate usage significantly differed in their attention, their wow. overall attention, and not just attention to like, you know, screens or anything else, but overall, and even the, the more severe group really started to develop what looked like ADHD symptoms, wow. even though they didn't have anything at all there. So, wow. um, so I, I think as parents, we have to kind of be a little humble about the fact that way God designed our, our minds is that that unconscious world plays a lot into what we do. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking about this, you know, it's like, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're doing this, you're doing this experimental parenting of not giving your kids cell phones. Right. Like, like, okay, well, you know, we'll see how, we'll see how they turn out. It's a great sure. experiment, but we're living in the great experiment. Like it, we've, we've not it done is. tests on like, well, you know, what's, what's the long, because we're, we're, we're at the first generation of children right now who people who are graduating high school right now, cell phones have been in their life, their entire life. Right. It, it was this right. interesting point in my, in my 
priesthood where I'm doing marriage prep and I always, there's a part where I have to ask like, Hey, just write down your mom's phone number because we have to ask, you know, these mm -hmm. questions. And, and like, there's this point where people still remember their mom's phone, their phone numbers, because they didn't get a cell phone until after they were old enough that they'd already memorized phone numbers. Right. And then there's right. people like, so if you're older, like me, like all the phone numbers I had memorized, I have my Six six five four nine two four. That was my childhood yep. phone number. Four, I haven't four, seven, one, seven, oh, right? I, <laughs> I, yes, I haven't lived yes. there in thirty years. Yeah. You know, I yes. uh, remember that. Yeah. I I don't know my mom's phone number. You know, right. because it's right. in the cell phone. I don't need to remember it. Um, but but like we're we're this is an experiment. Like we're in the great experiment right now, 100%. and we don't know how it's going to turn out. And, and we see, and, and we're concerned about where yeah. it's been going. You're right. We have declared this the last 15 years as one of the biggest social experiments that has ever really existed. Yeah. And if you think about the numbers, in '99, only one in three people had a cell phone. Right. 2007 is when the iPhone was introduced. Mm -hmm. And it took a few years to migrate downward as far as age. And so, in essence, really, the last 15 years are this massive, massive social experiment, um, yeah. especially with our youth in that way too. So, um, and we're, you know, there's just a lot of areas we're starting to see come out of it. It's it's fascinating, you know, I mean, technology in, in general, but um, I was, I was taking a, a course and it was kind of a historical survey. And the professor said at one time, we are more, or no, he's, how do you say it? Like somebody in the 19, uh, like 1901, had more in common with somebody in, uh, you know, 1501 than right. they do in somebody in 2001. You That's know? a really, I mean, striking thought. Think about, it. yeah, all the things, even in the last 20 years, how the rest of the world previously had no idea, right? If you had told C.S. Lewis back in the day, yeah. the internet's going to exist and all of this is going to come to be. And as you're reflecting on the world, that's going to reshape things. You know, I mean, most of those people would have thought that seems impossible, but dear, that's a great point. It's like this tiny segment of history. And of course the risk is to think that life couldn't have existed outside that bubble. Right. right? But right, like, right. this tiny segment of history is so different from this massive segment that has existed before Largely related to the communication revolution, obviously the ability to travel like we do. You know, I mean, we're sitting yeah, here in yeah. Minneapolis having, you know, been able to do things that even a hundred years ago people thought would have been possible, right? Yeah. So, yeah. and and th I think that's the that's the danger, you know. So like, okay, cell phones, yeah. I mean, it's it's technology. Mm -hmm. It's it's helpful. It can be used well. It's a tool, mm -hmm. um, like just like just like the car, just like I mean, and we don't want it. We don't want to get into like. The whole, I mean, there's a, there's a quote from like, I, I forget, uh, who is it like Socrates or Plato or something like, oh, you know, books, you know, it's a bad thing because we're not going to remember things anymore, <laughs> you know, and it's like, okay, so let's, right. we don't want to be like down on technology. But I think the danger in our age in particular is that we think that we're better human beings because we have technology. We're, we're progressing to a point where we're superior and we think right. back and like, well, those people, they didn't even, they didn't even have cars. So they don't, it's like, well, no, they, they lived a different, different life, but uh, we're not better because we have technology. That's right. And, and there's, there's yeah. kind of this myth that we can just keep progressing technologically into you know like into gods yeah you know we wouldn't say it like that but that's what all of the avenger movies are about <laughs> and i think the other danger that's inherent in that is that we call the, the danger of dependence and the danger of distraction right mm. so if you think about those two dangers right is as we think we are progressing because we have technology the risk and, and again we're seeing this playing out more from a scientific standpoint is we're becoming increasingly distracted. In fact, they've done studies looking at the attention span of human beings in the last 15 years, um, and it's it's really declining significantly. Uh, and we're becoming so dependent that we can't imagine, again, how life could have existed outside of this area, right? So right. like you said, any, any tool, any device um, potentially has good uses. But I, I think one of my worries as a psychologist and as a father and everything else is just that we are becoming more and more distracted and dependent in ways that um, we we kind of, I, I, here's the this is something I want to throw out. We're, I think we're kind of struggling with the questions that we're asking that are most important. So here, mm. here's one thing I run into a lot. You know, if, if people ask me, is the current like climate of how we're kind of immersing ourselves, is it more convenient? Is it more accessible? Is it, you know, provide more experiential opportunities? I can't ever say it doesn't, right? I mean, of course, this is so more convenient or experiential or accessible than it's ever been. But 
and that's often seen as progress, right? Like that's the that's the mode of progress. Right. But if we ask people today, in the current climate that we're talking about here, right here, are we healthier? And by healthier, I mean physically healthier, psychologically healthier, socially healthier, and spiritually healthier with how this is being utilized. Well, having again spoke widely and kind of really done been the research for about fifteen years, we we really have a hard time saying that yes. Right. Yeah. So where where is our questions? Where are the questions coming from? And and where are we kind of prioritizing? I don't yeah. Know, get into that. I, I think the other thing we can say is like, okay, we've we've made we've been improving. We've been improving. We've been growing. We've, we're progressing. And I would right. say, right. Where what are we? What are we? progressing towards it's a great question what what's our goal here? what's our what's our goal what's our goal to be the most convenient society in history or would we say that's not necessarily the goal we want to go after you know then, then i yeah. think that's that's the real question of today um, and i run up against that a lot i think that it's hard because when something is more convenient or more accessible we as human beings in some ways are wired to kind of seek that out like ooh, it, it seems nice even if like, you know, I, I even a lot of my friends who give me a hard time about not having a cell phone will acknowledge too that Wait, you have friends, I even know. though you don't have a cell phone. I know. I have, I, by the way, I, have, <laughs> I have one friend who also doesn't have a cell phone. Trent, if you're out there, you know, we love to, we love to joke about those guys. Right. So I actually have friends without having a cell phone, at least they tell me they're my friend. You know, we'll go with that. Right. Yeah. But I think what's interesting is that while the access is nice, I think many of them would acknowledge like, oh, but I don't like the fact that I feel like I'm chronically distracted by yeah. this device. And what do we do with that? So, so I, every year I go on a, a silent retreat, mm -hmm. you know, priests are required to do a retreat. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a silent retreat. I love silent retreats. Um, I remember early on in my priesthood going to retreats with big groups of, of priests and them sharing, we're sharing graces at the end. When several guys like, man, it took me like, three days before I turned off my phone and I'm like, <laughs> what? Like that, that for me is like, no, turn this thing off. Like right. throw it, Boss it out. Right. Yeah. Go so, silent. so this year I went on a retreat in, in Arizona and um, it was just a hermitage. So I had a little, a little hut all to myself in the, in the Canyon. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, and I didn't have any schedule. There's nobody else. There's nobody else there. I had the hut. I had the chapel. I had my my prayer books. I brought a couple other things, and I was like, "Well, maybe I'll read this book, and maybe I'll work on this this writing project that I've been wanting to work on." Uh, I found the Lord just inviting me into, uh, just into a real simplicity of silence, of slowing down, mm -hmm. and of not multitasking. Mm -hmm. And so, where, whereas my normal morning, I'll I'll wake up and I'll. I'll pray, I'll pray, you know, we have our breviary that we pray every day and I'll pray my breviary and, and I'll drink my coffee. I'm like, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to drink my coffee and then I'm going to pray my breviary. Mm -hmm. And when I was eating, I, sometimes I'll read a book or put an audio on. I'm like, nope, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, I'm just going to eat yeah. and stare out the window. Right. And, you know, so I, I would wake up whenever my body woke me up, which is usually pretty early and it's still dark out. And I would drink my coffee for like, an hour. I just, I just sit drinking my coffee, staring at the stars outside. And then I'd get up and I'd go to the other chair and I'd pray my breviary, which, you know, normally you can get done with in a half hour. I'm like an hour. I just, I just sit there. I just slowly, I'd ponder, I'd meditate. Then I'd get up and I go to the chapel and then I'd take, I'd take like an hour to say mass by myself. You know, I'm by not, yourself, I'm not right, giving a homily, right, right, you know, right. I'm not like, I'm just so like, <laughs> not a wide audience. No, here, you know, yeah, I'm yeah, just, yeah. I'm just slowly, slowly praying. I come back, I'd get my food ready. I didn't have any, there's no meal times I had to worry about. So I was just, whenever, whenever it's time to eat, I just slowly peel my egg. It would take like an exorbitant amount of time. Right. Something's like, and then I, and I eat and I'd stare out the window and it was so freeing. Mm -hmm. It was so good. There was nothing calendared. There was no expectations. There's nowhere I had to be. There's nobody who needed me. There was no cell phone ringing. There's no emails to check. Um, I wasn't doing two things at once. I wasn't juggling anything. Um, it was it was the best retreat I've ever I've ever had. Isn't it amazing what happens when we give ourselves the right yeah. to not multitask? Yeah. And when, if you add to my crazy list, people would say the other crazy thing you do is you enjoy backpacking. And um, over the years, my brothers and I and some friends, we've done some great trips in the national parks. Or mm -hmm. and one of the things I love about the most is that you just kind of run on your time and God's time. That's really the only time you're running on, right? Yeah. So I get up in the morning 
I got to, you know, get things ready to go. You know, sun's coming up. We wake up whenever, get things packed up. We're going to go on our, our next segment. The rhythms, in some ways, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you're just kind of allowing the rhythms of your life and your yeah. day yeah. to be as they would be. And you're not feeling pressed by other demands that say that that rhythm isn't worth anything, right? Like you're just kind of allowing that to kind of play out. And I, yeah. I think with backpacking and, and that element, it's just the same way. It's just the rhythm of walking, right? The simple act of walking, which really isn't at all from a neurological standpoint, simple, right? And something that we take for granted like everything else, but um, allowing that, even the flow up and down the hills, all of that, um, it really just provides an amazing opportunity for greater reflection, introspection, greater appreciation, yeah. gratitude, all yeah. of that, right? The thing yeah. that we really desire in our lives, but I would say, and I certainly am guilty many times of being busy and just saying, well, I desire it, but like, I really can't afford to give it up for other things I need to do. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And so I ended up, I ended up not reading any of the book. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of the project and no. I wasn't, I wasn't bored seven no. days in a cabin by myself. I wasn't bored for no. a second. Yeah. And same thing, you know, I've been up in you know, boundary waters and right. same thing, like right. me and my buddies, we wake up, we drink our coffee, we talk staring at the lake. And then we're like, well, we missed the morning fishing. We should probably stop drinking coffee so we can have our hour fast before we stay mad. Right, right. <laughs> you know? At some point, we probably, yes. So why, I mean, from, you know, from your clinical experience, like why when, when, we've, when we've experienced this, and I think probably most listeners can say, yeah, I've had a, I've had a time where, you know, um, my, my phone broke and I was without it or I lost it. And like, those, even though there's some inconveniences, I, my phone broke a couple a month ago or so and i had to print out directions <laughs> other, you know right? yeah like, um, seriously. i had to print out but other than <laughs> other than that like we probably have those moments where we're like oh, i was actually it was actually good mm -hmm. um why why do we find it so hard to do the things that we know we should do <laughs> hearing saint paul here <laughs> i think that i think the big thing is that we the demands are, are around us we have been conditioned to see them as more important than let's say carving out silence, right? So we have from an early <clears throat> age been conditioned to say that being progressive, being productive mm. is getting more things done, right? Yeah, so that's what yeah. we've been told. And so, you know, we kind of adhere to that and it's understandable again, because our lives are busy, that we feel almost guilty <clears throat> if we don't utilize our time in ways that are most productive. Yeah. So I would, I would say that part of it is really, um, Part of it is an artifact of the lives that we lead in this country. We, you know, we have, if we're very honest, we have very privileged lives that we're able to do all the things that we can do, you know, but with privilege then comes pressure. And the question is, you know, are we kind of bound by that? And so part of it's the social conditioning of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I also think that part of it is, and it, it was interesting years ago, we're part of a, we call, it's called the Godcast, but podcast group that's locally. And typically there's a podcast that, you know, is listened to. And then, you know, you come together for discussion. And my wife and I decided one day that we were going to, um, instead of having a podcast, we were going to do, it's 20 minutes of silence, right? Mm. And that was the, that was the podcast for each person. All you had to do was go for 20 minutes of silence and, um, and then kind of reflect on what that was like. And I think that the other piece is that we oftentimes can be kind of fearful like, I think when people are hearing you describe that, there's a, there's a group listening that says, I don't know, father, like mm -hmm. that kind of, I'm afraid of what I might start hearing myself or I'm afraid <laughs> of what boredom might do. Yeah. And so we have been kind of made afraid of a sense of silence that our predecessors really didn't have a choice, right? Because back when you were a hundred years ago, working on the farm, you didn't have, you know, your earbuds in, there was nothing to basically not create the silence for you that today we can kind of find our ways to create enough noise that we don't really have to reflect that. So I would argue that part of it's conditioning and part of it's fear that kind of keeps us away from seeing that as something that is necessary for our lives. And that yeah. 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 I think, I think about that, you know, like you think about St. John Vianney, you know, patron saint of right. priests right. and, you know, he's 16 hours in the confessional and, you know, all these, all this great ministry. And, and I'm like, yeah, but he didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have to respond to right. text messages and and emails and just this r radical accessibility. Yeah. And and you think it's like, well, well, what about I me? Mean, people are dying. You know, like what? What if like, yeah. Well, they were dying back then too. And if 
somebody was dying, you went and got the priest, you, you know, sent somebody to walk and run, run to get the priest. And right. he ran with you back. And, right. um, yeah, there, there, it's just, it's just different level. And, and I know, I mean, like, I don't know if, uh, how much you, you know, probably in your, your practice, but you've probably heard, I mean, like there's a mental health crisis among children. There's also a mental health crisis among priests and adults in general too. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, and I know yes. priests who like good men who, take their holy hour every day and are faithful to their prayers and, mm -hmm. and suffer from anxiety and depression. And, mm -hmm. um, because there are so many demands. And so, it, you know, like, I, th I mean, some people are always mad at, you know, for, for, for all the ages of the church, you, you know, people have been mad at the priests for, for whatever, mm -hmm. but now they can, when they're in their frustration or anger, they can shoot them off an angry text message or email. Um, whereas before it was like, ah, I'm so mad at the priest and, Okay, by the time I see him, I'm not that mad anymore. Right. It's not that big of a deal because because those things weigh. It's so heavy, and and I think I mean yes. that's what we see with, you know, the 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 social media amongst children, especially. It's like somebody says something because they can just say it, and now it's just weighing on them, and they don't have the tools to. That's right. Well, and it, it not only is it weighing on them, it also never really goes away from an online perspective too. You know, yeah. think about this, like when I was in high school and none of us had cell phones and I graduated in 1995, you know, the internet was not being used. If something happened at school that, you know, was embarrassing or whatever, I mean, obviously you encounter it and it was uncomfortable, you know, that kind of went on. And maybe that came back to school the next day and for a little while. Yeah, a week later, it's well, gone. Well, it's gone. Yeah. Today, something happens, there's a good chance it was recorded. Yeah. It's posted. It, re it continues to grow a life on social media. And so these kids, and I think this is something that's really, really important for people to know, is that when you look at the young teenagers, that is the, our brain development is most prime for social feedback. And in some ways, it's, hmm. it's how we're designed, because as you're getting older, the social world becomes increasingly important at sixth to eighth grade, right? And that's when you start to establish relationships and even romantic relationships and things like that. Yeah. The problem with the onset of social media being, especially when it is, is that it overlays that most sensitive period. So whereas you and I, even if we say, oh, it can weigh on us, you know, our ages, it weighs significantly on those younger teens because they are primed in that way. Yeah. So then it just, you know, it, it becomes a real burden and, you know, it was interesting. My the, uh, actually, the friend I mentioned earlier, he reviews scholarships for um, it's you know one of the scholarship applications, kind of the highest level of scholarship in Indiana. So he's one of those reviewers. And one of the questions was asked this year: of all the things that have happened in the world, all the things that have occurred, which one would you most wish had wish had never happened? Hmm. Two things emerged most out of all the answers and interestingly it was vaping and smoking mm. and cell phones mm. those wow. were the number ones that the the seniors who were answering this question most said despite all the conveniences i just wish i didn't have to deal with it i mm. wish they hadn't and i think that it's just it's the sense of pressure you know it's like who that's i i joke that back in high school i was already really busy or at least i thought it was busy right and and that was you know with everything going on in athletics and academics but overlay that with all that these these teams have to manage so it's coming into their phone and that level pre added pressure even if it's good stuff it can be a lot and i think that's kind of something we really have to discern in the social experiment that we've been a part of here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it is. And and I think, you know, I'm like every, every age has its own challenges right. and, and human beings, we, we are adaptable. Um, but that doesn't mean we should just keep walking into, I had this conversation with our, our middle schoolers last week, actually, in the school, uh, just talking about, talking about technology and how this is, this is the problem with the technological scientistic mind in um you know from the early 1900s and on or even late 1800s we're like wow look what we can do mm -hmm. oh if we can do that we can do this if we can do that we can do this we can do that we can do and nobody nobody ever stopped and said whoa 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 should we right right should we do that yes and and i think the first time that we had a kind of a, a global wake-up call was uh hiroshima nagasaki mm -hmm. and then we were like mm -hmm whoa, look what we just did. Should we have asked the question, you know, back here, should we do this? Not, can we do this? Yeah. And we can kind of get like bloodthirsty, like, wow, ooh, yeah. You know, the, breaking a new record and yeah. designing a new thing. And 
and that's that you know so from the from the moral perspective especially for for christians that's always a question we should, should i should i be doing i i can do a lot of things well and i think and i said this in, in one of the books i wrote that i think you know we have a very outcomes focused society but a very process oriented god right you think mm. about like the pursuit of virtue it, really everything that god asks us to do is to say Adopt my process, right? Mm, Lay mm, this out for mm. you, right? And and nothing's guaranteed in life on this world. You could do everything according to the process, but things may happen that you don't want to happen. But I need you to adopt this process. I need you to pursue the virtues of love and faith and hope and you know temperance and charity you know, or temperance and justice, because there's lots of reasons that that inherently is not only good for you, but also around us, right? But then our society says, back to what you just said, but look what we can do, right? And look at how we can achieve. And so, again, doing and achieving in a lot of ways is not a bad thing, but I feel as if we get caught in this trap of thinking that that's the, that becomes a God in of itself, mm, right? Yeah. What outcome can I get to? And and I, I, I really like how you frame it because we're often so focused on the outcome that we don't even sure about the questions that we might need to be asking, yeah. right? Like, just because I can do this really should I do this? Or do I want to do this? Right. Do I, you know, do I, do I want to go after that, you know, like new innovation, even if it's going to compromise my own internal state? I think that's the thing that we're kind of faced with today, especially with this, this whole revolution is the innovation. I, I can't argue it's phenomenal. Like having a supercomputer in, in your hand is, I can't imagine like the technology that's behind it. So I don't have any issue with the technology and it's, it is phenomenal and used well. I think it can be used um, you know, for good purposes, but should we use it in the way we're using it mm -hmm. is really yeah. a question we need to be yeah. asking, right? Yeah. Not can we, but should we, and do we want to? And I think that when people give me a hard time and it is always a good topic of conversation, we're like, wait, you don't have a cell phone? Like, and when, if people are ever interested in that conversation, one of the things I would, I just have said for me is because I'm so busy father of eight and he was a pediatric psychologist and a vice president of our psychology department and training director in all these roles. I started realizing early on in my life that I think, unfortunately for me, and everybody has to make their own decision, having the cell phone was going to further distract me. It was one of the reasons why I realized, like, I think that I I can take on these roles better, psychologically feel healthier um, without it, you know, and, and, and there are times where it's inconvenient, but most of the time I'm really glad that Again, and people around me have supported me, even though they gave me a hard time. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to have a CEO and others who recognize like, hey, you know, I may never agree with him, but like I can understand why he's making that decision. So, yeah. But, yeah. And, and I think I think that's um, that that's the, the like it, the, the hard thing is we we don't do well with moderation in general. Right. That's that's hard. That's right. a, a virtue, I, it, you know, virtues in the, in the middle. And so it's like. I'm not going to have one at all. That's that, that might be easier than like <laughs> using one moderately, you know, because yeah, yeah. we tend to over and we know that. And we're like, right. I hear confessions and many of those confessions have to do with an overuse of, of technology in some way or another, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Um, and sometimes it's just, it's just the scrolling, you know, like, you know, raise your hand. If you've ever confessed, I just wasted time scrolling, mm -hmm. you know, social media or, or watching YouTube videos or, or whatever. And, and so I, I think, you know, from the spiritual perspective, we want to be, we want to get better at uh, discerning the, the, the discernment of spirits. I mean, so this is Ignatius of Loyola's, right. you know, big contribution to the church. Not that he invented it, but he kind of mainstreamed it, that he, he was stuck in his hospital bed and he's reading these stories of knights and fair ladies and, and all this. And he, he loves that stuff. And he's a, he's a military guy and he's a, he's a hero and he's a, he's a manly dude. And he's, he's reading these stories and he's like, yeah, this is, this is great. And he closed the book and he said it. And then he just start to feel himself like empty. Mm -hmm. And then somebody gave him some stories of the life of Christ and the life of the saints. And he would read that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't as, you know, passionate response, but it still enlivened him in some way mm -hmm. that when he, and then when he put the book down, that stayed. And, and we need to have a similar discernment with our, with our technology. Right. You know, if, after I'm, after I've stayed up too late, uh, scrolling Facebook and finally put the phone down and lie in bed right then, what am I, what am I feeling right then? Am I right. feeling like, right. ah, that was time well spent yes. or, or, you know, like, when you get off of the, a phone call with a good friend and put your, like, and then discern that, like, oh, I feel, 
I feel mm-hmm. good. Like I just had a, a meaningful connection mm-hmm. and, and that was, that was good. So if I can, if I can learn how to use my phone for, well, you know what, the, the convenience of, Hey Siri, take me to this place. Then my phone's going to like ring somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, it like, okay. Rather than like, Oh shoot, because I'm technical, I'm like directionally impaired and you know, I'm going to be lost everywhere. Okay. Right. Can I use it for that? And making the phone calls and the the few other things that it is it a tool or am I like constantly thinking about it and discerning that like, Oh, I'm agitated right now. Is it have something to do with the technology in my pocket? Yeah. If it does, then how do I how do I find a way to treat it more like a real phone that actually was you know on the wall somewhere in some other room? You know. Right. Um, right. But but I think that like does this make my life better? And then define better. What do you mean yes. by better? That's right. More peaceful, more human, more loving, more joyful. Um, if it's not doing those things, uh, then you know, maybe it's maybe I maybe I should mitigate it or get rid of it or downgrade it. There's a study what uh, looks at different types of happiness and well-being. Mm. This and this is really interesting. You were into this, um, and they talk about defining two different kinds of what we consider well-being. One is hedonic well-being, and that's the idea of like, let's say I go to you know like Dairy Queen, I get a blizzard, right, and it feels good and I love it. You know, it's at that moment it's great. And again, God created us in a lot of ways, and that there's nothing necessarily wrong with what we're talking about but hedonic well-being is contrasted where i that i feel good just the hedonism Mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about so it's the pleasure and the happiness that i get derived versus what we call eudaimonic with eu is eudaimonic well-being which is feeling good about myself Hmm. and what they find is that when it when you look at like sources of happiness and they've done a lot of research around this area you know there's the engaged life, the meaningful life, and the pleasurable life, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. All three contribute to overall happiness and contentment. But when they look at people who sustain it the longest, it tends to be those who create more of the meaningful life and the engaged life and don't rely as much on the like hedonistic pleasurable mm-hmm. side, right? Mm-hmm. Because what they find, and, and maybe this is in some ways we as Christians kind of contrast joy and happiness, is that the sense of joy in the sense of like, eudaimonic well-being resonates long after the actual act itself has occurred right, right? Yeah, so yeah. like we you and i were on the way here we were talking about running and we were talking about this idea of sometimes you're in the middle of a run you think oh man you know like maybe maybe <laughs> not right now like <laughs> doing things many much more enjoyable <laughs> pleasurable but most of the time after a run we feel good about ourselves and feel good about what's gone on and even even and i've had runs before even days later even even more than that I still feel a sense of positivity that kind of originates, yeah. right? And I think that that idea of eudaimonic well-being, like, for example, the research behind volunteering is really, really neat. You know, we're in the season of Lent, right? And giving alms and helping others is a big part of Lent. Well, there's some really great research that indicates that the person who volunteers um, can really reap a lot of social and psychological benefits from the mm. act of volunteering, oh, right? And so there we have this idea of, I'm not only doing something that feels good maybe in the moment, but like I feel good about myself. And there's a concept um, that came in the early 80s that's called the concept, and it's pretty straightforward, but the idea of mattering. So like when I feel like I matter to Mm -hmm. other people or I matter to my world or I matter to God, I'm much more likely to feel a sustained sense of positive mood, you know, in general. But if I don't feel like I matter, if I don't think, you know, because when I go eat that blizzard at Dairy Queen, like it feels good, but like, I'm not sure that that matters a whole lot mm-hmm, to other people. Right, right. Um, when I don't have consistent sources of eudaimonic well-being and a sense of mattering, then I find myself kind of vacillating over yeah. and over in ways that doesn't, it feels transient, right? Yeah, it just yeah. feels like, ugh, I'm a little bit lost there. Well, and I think that gets to, you know, like the convenience, we're like, oh, we're, if we get more convenient and more convenient, right? but right. But nobody ever felt good about themselves in a eudematic way after doing something that was just merely right. easily easy and convenient. Right. You know, uh, and I think this is you know like the running, like nobody nobody brags about having done something easy. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody says like, you know what, right. you know the blizzard I ate yesterday. It's like no, you brag. I have four about, of them. They're yeah, right. Uh, okay. You so. know, like you you brag about something that was really hard. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I ran I ran fifty miles yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like whoa yeah. like yeah 
I, I remember I was listening to a, a book and uh, there's somebody, somebody's talking about like, why, we, why we run? Why do we, people ask, why do we, why do we run? We don't run because it's fun. No. We run because it's hard. And that's because like, it's meaningful. Yeah. And because in, inherent in that, like we were talking about before, there's an invitation to reflect more deeply to kind of grow. Right. Yeah. But not because you think, oh, it's, you know, 20 degrees outside and I really want to pound out 10 miles today. Yeah. Right there. Right. But isn't isn't that fascinating that what we what we what we don't want to do uh, is the thing that if we do it we're going to brag about it yeah. the thing that the thing that we struggle the most to to get out the door for whether it's to run fifty miles or to go and and volunteer somewhere because it's like oh you know the mm-hmm. the homeless people smell and they're weird and then you go and then you're like wow that was so good it stays with you mm-hmm. it's the type of thing that you like tell people about like yeah we we went downtown and like gave sandwiches to homeless people on the streets it was it was it was hard it was scary but it was I meaningful. did that it meant something it, it, it meant something I, and i think that's the point of connection i, I um one of the things I've over the years decided to do is that whenever I, like I said, I bike to work and, and, you know, certainly run and do a lot of things. I, I feel a real sense of connection to people, especially when they're going through difficult times. And so I, I tend to offer every run that I do to yeah, someone that's yeah, going through something. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, it's years ago. I had just come off. My, I had a, my friend accidentally shut my finger in the door a day before a half marathon oh, no. and broke it. And I later had to have surgery. And so the next morning I'm out, you know, getting ready to run and, you know, I'm just kind of like, uh, oh, there's a little minor, but there's pain there. But the more I connected myself with people who were struggling more than I was, mm. I there was a deep, deep sense of meaning and purpose to that. Mm. And I think that's the offering here that comes with this idea of doing things that are hard, but they have great meaning is that we start to sense that this world is not just about us, of course, right? You know, Thomas Merton said, we don't live for ourselves. And he's right, you know. And of course, many Mother Teresa years ago said, you know, you may do all the things in the world you think God's calling you to do, and people may tear it down, but it wasn't about them anyway. It, ultimately, it's a spiritual pursuit. But all of that, we're taking on difficult things because, not because it's just intrinsically fun often, but because it means something. And I, I think the deeper yeah. you get there, and from a psychologist standpoint, you find that you you build this source of like this well grows. Yeah. And I, 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 there's, you know, there's been things decades later I can come back to that. I, let's say it's been a difficult day, right. Or, you know, the things are not going the way, or you feel like you're criticized on many levels, but there are things I can come back to where I felt like that. I really is spending that time with God. And I do say that to people these days, they often ask, you know, what are you training for? What are you doing? And Truth be told, it, it, it's wonderful prayer time. It's wonderful mm-hmm. time to spend with God. And and yes, I may be training for something or whatever, and that that allows me to channel it specifically into a, a discipline. But really, I really mostly am giving, creating avenues of silence, like we were talking mm-hmm. about earlier, mm-hmm. prioritizing it, and then being able to be in a place where it doesn't matter what my role, status, et cetera, et cetera, is. Like, I'm most a child of God. That's the most important. Oh, amen. Right? Amen. Yeah. And it, that just it's just so important for me in my life to be able to have those regular sources yeah. of opportunity. But and and how beautiful too that, you know, like we're this this is how God designed us. Oh, you know, so we're, we're designed. We're right. we're designed to to do hard, meaningful things. And yet our our fallen human nature uh shirks against that and yet when we when we do those things you know this is that resistance like mm-hmm. i'm resisting the good, the good the good thing because it's hard even though i know i've had those experiences where i actually feel better afterwards for longer and and yeah. and, and i think maybe to kind of draw the conversation to to a conclusion and come back like that's that how can cell phones technology whatever aside how can we help our children to grow in the love of hard, meaningful things. Yeah. I think that, I think we early on have to really engender a couple things on this thought. I think that it's important for our kids at the youngest of ages to recognize that all life is an adventure, yeah. right? Yeah. It is an adventure. Okay. And we may not like this adventure. Yeah. Um, we may not like the way that things are going. I often, you know, kind of say that it, it's but adven- some, adventure is conflict and conflict. conflict is hard. It is hard. But if, but here's the thing. If you, everyone loves a good adventure story when you're reading it, you <laughs> may not love it when it's your life, right? But what uh, someone who really embraces adventure embraces the idea that even those times when you're down or even when things are difficult, 
they are replete. They're full of meaning. And I, and I think that one of the things we need to do with our kids is to really like really engender them in this idea that life is an adventure and, and it's going to be tough. And you're going to mm-hmm. think, you know, the, the thing about happiness is the only thing happiness teaches us typically is that we want more of it, right? When you're feeling great, you really just kind of want more of it. But it's only the times when things get more difficult, right? The only the times when you kind of encounter obstacles that you're faced with this question of, well, can you grow mm, or should you yeah, grow, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, as, as we kind of draw this to a close, one of the things is is to really kind of excite our, our children because I, I worry that our kids stay in this culture of convenience, see that things that are difficult are unnecessary. Mm. And it's not that we should, it's not that we should just go forward and say, oh, again, suffering in itself is not in a virtue, right? We shouldn't just necessarily do things just because it's hard without any greater purpose. But like, we do want to say, hey, don't be afraid of things being difficult and find excitement in it. And then whether I, I will say this, one of the great joys of my last five years is that through my running my own kids, they've done some half marathons and I've oh, been able cool. to train with them. Yeah. And the early morning hours, you know, I, just yesterday, my son and I got up and it was, you know, it was like 35 degrees and the wind was blowing. It's probably 15 or 20 miles an hour. And, you know, we ran just a 5K, whatever. It was short. But that time spent alone with Noah is some of the greatest joy mm-hmm. I feel, yeah. period. Yeah. Uh, we're doing things together that we don't have to do. We're sharing it. We're sharing the difficulty. We're sharing the purpose. And then we go about our days and, you know, we come back to that, that same place. And so it's been definitely a great joy. Amen. Beautiful. Well, yeah, this has been, this has been great. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's, no. it's always a lot of fun to share kind of that way. Yeah. Awesome. And, and I think yeah, it's just, it is, it's the, the intentionality, the, the attunedness to what's going on and in, inside and, and and not letting not letting the the rules of you know pop culture raise right. our children or dictate what we do or or whatever else like right. let's right. what's what's the lord what's the lord calling us to um for sure so, yeah good good well i think that's a that's a wrap that's, that's great yeah. thanks so much father for yeah. inviting me again so. absolutely thanks yeah. for listening we'll see you all next time